Hello, and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church's Sermon Podcast for Sunday, December 3rd, 2017, the first week of Advent. It's the 12th week of the story, our 31-week journey through the Bible. Today, Rev. Dr. Paul Cunningham is looking at chapter 12 of the story, King David. Paul's sermon is titled, A King Reflects, and he's looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 20. Please listen after the sermon for a few announcements. You can also learn about what's happening at La Jolla Prez by visiting our website, ljpress.org, downloading the La Jolla Press app on your smartphone or tablet, or by contacting the church office at 858-454-0713. And now, here's Paul with A King Reflects. A couple of other things um, in regards to Advent. One, you may recall that uh, last year, Stan Beard uh, wrote a number of Advent uh, devotionals, daily devotionals. He has done that again this year, and so um, it's totally different than what it was last year. Uh, so, uh, those are available, I believe out in the back and throughout the church. But if you want to kind of follow along, um, on this Advent journey, uh, using some of Stan's writings, that would be great and would encourage you to do that. Um, also, as you know, we have a La Jolla Press Art Guild, um, and every Advent season, those artists, uh, create different works of art, um, that kind of reflect on where we're going in our sermon series during Advent. And so those are available, uh, for you to go and view this morning out over in the fellowship hall. So I would encourage you. Uh, to do that and take a look at um, the creativity that we have in and amongst our group. So this morning, as we move into uh, the season of Advent, we're actually going to be um, thinking about, if you're working your way through the story with us, uh, we move into a series on kings that we're actually looking at. um, Last Sunday, we started kind of the, the beginning of the life of King David, and we made three points out of that, of saying that God sees you, Um, God treasures you, and God will make a way for you. That if we think about the life of David, as we think about our own lives, um, to know that God sees us and God treasures us is just such an important uh, reminder. But not only that, but that God also makes a way for us. Uh, This morning, as we uh, move into this season of Advent, we'll take a look at the end um, of the life of David. Next Sunday uh, is the story of King Solomon. And then the following Sunday is a number of kings, uh, but we're probably going to be focusing most of our attention on King Asa. So here's where the good news is. If you have, I mean, the good news is obviously right here, but um, besides the good news of Jesus, if you have been reading through the story and you are like, man, I am so behind. I don't, I won't make you raise your hand if this is how you feel. Um, you're like, how in the world am I ever going to catch up? So this is the good news for you. Okay. So Christmas Eve, December 24th, we're taking a break from the story, okay? And actually, New Year's Eve, Sunday as well, we're taking a break from the story. So you basically have about two and a half weeks to catch up on everything, okay? So from December 24th to basically January is at the 7th, um, we won't be preaching through the story. So you have a chance to kind of get caught up and, you know, just feel better. You know, it's a good New Year's resolution, right? I mean, it's kind of a good way of, of getting caught up, but Um, Just to kind of make you aware of that. So if you're in a growth group or a small group and you're working through that, uh, the Sundays of December 24th and 31st, we will not be following uh, through the story curriculum. But this morning we are uh, reflecting, if you will, on the end of King David's life. Um, The text that we're going to consider in just a moment comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And it's literally basically the last words of David as he reflects as he looks back on his life and he considers where he's been, as he considers kind of who he is, the person God has created him to be, as he thinks about the way that he has lived his life, the way he has been able to influence others. And I think it's an important thing for us. And sometimes um, we, as we live out our lives, we, we have these moments um, of reflection. And a lot of times as we move to the end of the year, uh, we kind of reflect on where we've been and kind of where we want to go. Now, I have to admit, and I think my wife would readily agree, um, that reflection is not one of my strong points. Um, many, many of you may have this same thing in your marriage. If you're married and wives, you will look at your husbands because they look as though they are deeply engaged. You know this look that men have? Like they're just sitting there, 
and they are just pondering the things of the world as though there's some great insight that they're about ready to receive and then share with the rest of the world. Um, I, I guess I'm not the only guy in the room who's like this. And, and my, you know, I'll get into those moments. And my wife will be like, you know, what, what do you, th- you know, what, what's going on in there? Like, this looks like something that's really important that you need to share. And I'm like, nah, there's nothing going on. I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, whatever it is that, that, that just happened. I mean, there, you know, any of y'all ever had that, that sort of issue? Um, ladies, you can go ahead and raise your hands for your husbands if they're not raising their hands. Um, guys especially aren't very good at reflecting. Um, I think our society as a whole doesn't always push us to engage in a reflecting process because we move so fast and we've got different things that we need to do and we get behind on everything else. And then we don't really stop and think, you know, have I grown in this last year? Am I a better person? Am I a better follower of Christ? Am I more committed to the things that I said I wanted to be committed to um, a year ago? And so I love that, that, that we get to hear from David uh, towards the very end of his life as he kind of reflects back on some things that he thought uh, were very important for him. And so that's what we want to do this morning as we uh, continue on in this sermon series. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 29. Uh, we'll read verses 10 through 20, and I want to invite you to pray with me first. Um, God, for this morning, we thank you. Uh, thank you for your for the promise of your presence. Thank you for the, uh, the meal that is set in front of us that we will enjoy soon of being reminded of your goodness and your grace. God, now as we consider the life of David, would you help us to reflect on his life, but Lord, also to reflect on ours, uh, to kind of consider how we are living, how we are sharing, how we are caring for others. Allow these words of mine uh, to be taken through the power of your Holy Spirit uh, to encourage us and push us forward in this wonderful life that you have given to us. May we walk by faith and give you all the glory, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so David has gathered uh, the people of Israel, and he's about ready to um, pass on the reign, his reign, on to Solomon. Verse 10, it says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, now listen to the way he describes God. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, Saying, praise be to you, Lord, the God and Father of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, for you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have only given you what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand. All of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And for you dads, listen to this prayer that he has for his son. It's a great short little prayer. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands statutes and decrees and do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. I love that prayer. Lord, give my son wholehearted devotion to your commands. Then David said to the whole assembly, praise the Lord your God. So they, have all, they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the king. 
So the context of this is, and you may recall as you've been reading through uh, the story, as David's life comes to an end, he is told that he will be the one who helps raise the funds to build the temple, that God will actually have a dwelling place. Because up until this point, the Ark of the Covenant has traveled around. It's been in different places. But now the time has come uh, for a temple to be built. And David plows in, if you read in First Chronicles 22, just an incredible amount, an inordinate amount of resources um, to help build this temple. But before he gets to thinking about and talking about generosity, uh, we get to see some of the essence and the core, if you will, of who David truly is, of what his character is all about. A couple of years ago, David Brooks, who many of you probably read uh, in the New York Times or have read some of his books, uh, wrote the book called The Road to Character. And if you recall in that book, as he kind of led into that book, and he talked about Adam 1 and Adam 2, but, but he talked about, he says, there are um, resume virtues and there are eulogy virtues. And he said, as we consider our lives, are we more concerned about our resume building virtues or are we more concerned about what will be said at our eulogy and the virtues that will be shared there? And what his critique is that many of us are more concerned about our careers. We're more concerned about our resume than we are about our eulogy. We're more concerned about career than we are about character. And it's a rather indicting thing that he writes and to think about that. But, it, but it, he, what he's getting at is, the, is, is for us to consider kind of at the core. What really matters to us? Is it our career? Is it our resume? Is it the thing that, 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 that when you read, and I don't know how you are, and I, I don't read a ton of resumes, um, but when I read a really lengthy, 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 lengthy resume, you know what I think? I won't tell you what I think. Um, <laughs> But it's fascinating because there is something about what are we really trying to brag about. And, you know, I participate in Stan and Scott. Um, we participate in a number of memorial services. And it's fascinating to me to listen to what is shared about the person during these memorial services. Is it about character or is it about career? Is it about the love of Jesus or the love of other things? And what I really appreciate about the life of David, why I think that the scriptures tell us again and again and again uh, that well, he was a man after God's own heart, was that his very essence, his very character was grounded in the graciousness of God. How many times do we see David praising God? It's numerous. And here at the very end of his life, I love it. I mean, he gathers all of Israel around him and he says, together, let's praise the living God. Let's think about what it is that God has done for us. And as you read those words that describe how David speaks of God, I mean, they are amazing. He says, yours, God, is this is verse 11, the greatness, the power, the glory, the majesty, the splendor. Everything is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted um, as head over all. David just has this litany of praise as he gathers around the presence and the amazingness and the wonder of God. As it speaks of glory in verse 11, as it talks about this word glory, um, sometimes in the, 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 uh, the Hebrew scriptures, the word for glory is the word uh, kabod, uh, which has to do with heaviness. It's a word of force. But this is a different word here that's used for glory, and it has to do with splendor or beauty. And David, as he thinks about who God is and what God has done, he speaks of the beauty, the splendor of the living God. And I wonder as we reflect on our own lives, how much of our life is spent in praising the living God? Do we spend time not just acknowledging God's greatness, but giving thanks to him? I mean, I, 
every morning I wake up and I walk around where we live and I'm like, this is amazing. Well, I wish I did that every morning. Sometimes I just simply take that for granted. But this wonder and the power and the majesty and the splendor of the living God. David got that. That's what this final prayer of his is all about as he casts a vision for the people of Israel who are hearing him speak his very last words. He says, we have got to be people who praise the living God. And then as he continues on that prayer, though, we get to verse 14. Because David now reflects on himself. And we see this incredible sense of humility. But God... Who am I? Who am I that you would care for me? Who am I that you would love me? Who am I that you would (coughs) choose me? Who am I that you would see me? Who am I that you would treasure me? Because David realizes that, that in comparison to God, he really has nothing. He is only there in order to live fully and faithfully for God. He recognizes something that is so important and that everything belongs to God. And this is something I think many of us struggle with. Because it really isn't an essence or the essence, if you will, of the DNA or of, of the society in which many of us have been raised. Because we don't like to think that it all belongs to God. We've worked hard for it. We deserve it. We ought to be able to hold on to it. We ought to be able to direct where it all goes, whatever it is. And David says, look, the heavens are yours. My life is yours. Everything that you've entrusted to me, God, belongs to you. And it's this this incredible sense of humility that not only did David have great vision and great passion, but he also had great humility. I'm pretty, didn't Jim Collins say that, what great leaders are? Great sense of vision and great humility. Am I right in remembering that? Good to great. Any of y'all with me? I mean, that was written along, but I'm pretty, I think that was basically the essence of what he said. Incredible passion and vision and incredible humility makes level five leaders. Okay. I'll just go with that. I'll assume I'm right. Thank you. Let me know if I'm wrong so I can change it at 10 o'clock. If I remember to use that illustration, Uh, that's not on my notes, by the way, that's just a little freebie. So, um, so now you've gotten two books to read, right? You got good to great and whatever else I referred to earlier today. So we're on a roll here. Okay. So Humility. Do we see the importance of living for the sake of others? Of placing God first and foremost in our lives and figuring out how it is that we serve and live and love. The Apostle Paul puts it beautifully in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, reading through verse 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul says, if we want to understand humility, let us consider what Jesus has done for us. That he comes down for us. That that's what this Advent season is preparing us for. Is this arrival of Jesus. That he leaves the heavenly home of his father. That he leaves perfection and beauty and wonder and amazement and glory and splendor. And all those words that David uses to describe God. Jesus leaves all of that. And he says, I will dwell with humankind. This is the love that God has for his people. That those of us created in God's image, he comes down for us. He humbles himself. 
and becomes one of us. And David got that. Because what David is talking about and where this is all moving and as he's beginning to celebrate what's going to happen and what's going to be built for him, he begins to talk about how he himself invested in the kingdom of God. That he gives, I mean, I'm not going to go through and look at First Chronicles 22, but the resources that he gives to build up the temple, to build this home for God is unbelievable. But I really don't think we can get to the place of generosity. We can get to this place of compassion and caring and and, and building something for a future generation until we consider our own character and we consider of ourselves, are we living with humility? Are we living in praise to the living God? Do we really understand and do we believe that it all belongs to God? Because it is one thing to say, I'm with you, Paul, it all belongs to God. It is quite another thing to live as though it all belongs to God. And that's a tough distinction for us. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now, which is not atypical for me in a December, to talk about money. If you all have been at this church long enough, you know that uh, the way that God likes to handle this situation is to teach me faith. My wife says God always comes through, and I say yes, but sometimes people need to be reminded that God always comes through, um, including myself. So you know, if you've been here for a while, that in the months of June and December, we focus a little bit more, more in on stewardship than we normally do. We don't always run the financial numbers in our bulletins, and we don't always you know, make, a, make a big deal out of that. But typically, the giving patterns of our church in December and June are, are, are significant ones for us. And so I have no problem talking a little bit about that. And I don't do that in the sense of guilt. I don't do that in the sense of trying to create anxiety. I do that in the sense of just saying, we want to be honest where things are. So there's, there's great things to celebrate. Uh, first of all, I was noticing um, that through the month of November, so we do things a little weird here because we're on a fiscal year for our budget, but we kind of count money through the annual calendar year just to kind of see how things are going. But year to date, um, January through November, uh, your giving has actually been higher than the previous three years of giving January through November by at least $50,000 or something. So, um, so that's great. You know, that's, that's something, uh, you know, you always start with good news, right? So here you, here we go. Um, so that's, that's good news. And, and I see it and I sense, uh, the generosity of our congregation, um, you know, and, and as we do, and, and I've shared this before, uh, we are not a church that just decides randomly a, a operating budget we ought to have and just throw a dart at it and say, that sounds good. Um, we look at trends and how people have given, we look at our own budget, Um, As I shared a year ago, I think it was a year ago I shared this, um, our budget really over the 11 years that I've been a pastor at this church has not really changed dramatically. It's always been somewhere between about 2.5 and 2.8 million dollars. So it's not as though we're um, out, you know, spending lots of money. But um, through November, as we think about our fiscal year now, which is July through June, we're running behind about $70,000. The month of December... Uh, we look at five-year averages and then kind of create a budget around that. Uh, and so our best guess is we need about $450,000 in the month of December to kind of hit the mark um, where we want to be. Last year, we brought in like $460,000. So don't think that, um, again, none of this is random. It's just I want you all to know um, that we try to be the most faithful stewards we can with the resources you give us. Um, we are in the midst of trying to complete our uh, Creative for Community Capital campaign that allowed us uh, to create this amazing worship space that we have up front, um, re- renovate our entire children's wing, um, making progress on that. But the, the, the thing that I think a lot of us don't think about um, all the time, we think about it in our own homes, but we don't necessarily think about it in the church life. And that is the amount of money it costs simply to keep up this facility. And I'm not talking about utility bills or staff or any of that sort of stuff. But just what 
uh, deferred maintenance. We all have those, right? We have these accounts in our homes, right? We think about, oh yeah, I got to replace this, replace that. Um, on a facility like this, it's seventy-five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, and most of us don't think about that. Do you think about what we did with our capital campaign? A lot of it was deferred maintenance. Uh, we had a pipe organ that was basically toast. Um, Bill held it all together for a while. Our children's wing hadn't been renovated in over 20 years. Of that $3.5 million that we spent, I would guess 75% of it was simply deferred maintenance. And we're talking now, and I'm working with finance and stewardship folks, of saying, can we get creative about ways so we don't have to figure out every year how to find $75,000 to $100,000 just simply for deferred maintenance. And you'll probably be hearing more about that um, next year. That's why I love we have an incredible group of people um, who think very creatively, so we're working through some of that. But I share that just to say um, it, it takes a lot to keep this amazing space and place running. And I share that also to say because we don't just run it for ourselves. It's not just about a building for us. It is also for this community. I share with you this on a regular basis. Seven or 800 people on our campus every week who have no connection to La Jolla Presbyterian Church. Well, that's exercise groups, AA groups, ESL, scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Brownies, all those that simply use this space for free. Because we want to be good neighbors. But we really need your help to do that. So as you reflect on how this year has been, as you reflect on the way in which God has blessed you, we encourage you also to think about how can you help us to continue the mission that God has given to us? Now, some in the room probably think, oh, it's La Jolla Press. There's probably four or five donors who support almost the entirety of the annual operating budget. They really don't need my money. (laughs) Let me tell you something. You are incorrect if you think that. And it's not an issue of who gives what, but for me, there's a different issue. It's the importance of all of us contributing something to what God is doing. Andy Stanley, years ago, a pastor at North Point, had this great statement when he was talking about stewardship. Um, because a lot of times when you start talking about money, and some of you may already be thinking this, you're thinking to yourselves, Paul wants something from me. But honestly, I want something for you not from you. Because when we become more generous, I think we understand the grace and mercy of God even more. It causes us to trust more. And that's what I want for you. I want for you to know the joy that David has because he can say, I look at my own heart and I give with integrity and I give with joy because David understood the greatness of God and what God had done for him. David understood what it was to walk with humility. David understood what it was to make sure that God was first in his life. David knew what it was that everything belonged to God. That's what I want for you. So, that wasn't too bad, right? It's been a good market year. This is a great time to get rid of appreciated stock. (laughs) Let me just be very practical for you right now. And with the new tax code, who the heck knows what's going to look like next year. So just saying, all right? But it's what I want for you. I want you all to know the beauty and the wonder of the living God. I want for us to walk humbly with that God. I want to be like David, honestly. Because if you think about David's life, what was he influencing his people toward? 
What was he reflecting back? Here's what he was reflecting back. He was reflecting back a life that praised the living God. He was reflecting back a life that walked with humility. He was reflecting back a life that gave joyfully and with integrity. What if we were to influence one another in those ways? Of praising God. Of living generously. And I'll admit, it's not always easy. Because sometimes things get in our way. And that's why this table this morning is such an important reminder. I was reminded of this in my own little um, kind of self-centered way the other Friday of kind of the, the, the struggle that we have of the good and the, the not so good and living for self and, and living for others. Um, I was out running some errands on Friday morning and just driving along. And, and I usually, I, I don't usually listen to Christian music when I'm in the radio, when I'm, when I'm in the car, uh, I'm normally a sports radio guy, but I just had some Christian music on and I was just kind of singing along, you know, whatever the song was kind of in this wonderful, peaceful, blissful moment. And someone just cut me off. And I was like, you idiot, what are you doing? And then I just went back to singing Christian music, <laughs> kind of right back in that peaceful, glorious moment of like righteous anger and humility, praising God, anger. I'm sure none of you ever experienced anything like this. But it just reminded me of the struggle that we all daily face. Of trying to live fully and faithfully for God. But then life just getting in the way. And so I'm so grateful that we have a Savior who loves us. Even when we mess it up. Even when we don't fully get it right. We have a Savior, as the Apostle Paul tells us, who humbled himself and became one of us giving his life so that we might have life. And it is that Savior now who invites us to come and to share and to partake in this wonderful meal. Will you pray with me, please? God, thanks for loving us. Um, thank you that you are a God um, who is filled with grace and mercy. And God, sometimes we just can't get it right. But thank you for David, his influence. God, may we be people who influence others as well towards praise and humility and generosity. God, thanks for this table that reminds us that you come to us as an infant, but you came to save. And so as we gather now, Lord, would you feed us, restore us, and give us hope? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. Here's some of what's going on around La Jolla Prez. You can also find a complete listing on our website at ljpress.org. November and December account for 27% of LJPC's budgeted income. As we entered the month of December, we were running about $83,000 behind in expected giving. We will be keeping you posted in the bulletin on our progress. Our November projected income is $177,000, and November's actual income was $153,000. As end-of-year giving approaches, please remember the church and help us finish the year strong. As you may recall, LJPC did a major renovation of our sanctuary and children's wing in 2015 and 16. Pledges were to be completed by the end of 2017, if you are not sure you have completed your pledge, please contact the business office. The annual choir Christmas concert will be Sunday, December 10th at 4 and 7 p.m. Join the LJPC family for a joyful celebration of Christmas. LJPC's choral ensembles and a professional orchestra create a moving retelling of the Christmas story through song and scripture. 
The concert will feature many carols, including longtime LJPC favorite The Many Moods of Christmas, as well as Vivaldi's setting of Mary's song. It's a free concert with no tickets required. We have refugee families supported by our mission partners who have little means to celebrate Christmas. If you, your growth group, or a group of friends would like to adopt a family for Christmas or fill a bag with needed supplies, from cleaning supplies to diapers to toiletries, please stop by the table in the courtyard on Sundays or contact Michelle Whitney at michellew at ljpress.org. Filled bags need to be returned by December 7th. If you would like more information about these announcements or anything else happening at La Jolla Press, you can find our website at ljpress.org. That's l-j-p-r-e-s dot o-r-g. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. Thanks for listening and have a blessed day.